excuse me, somebody in Kenya is uh, requesting for a password to join the meeting, please. Good day, good night, good morning, wherever you are. My name is Gordon Tapper, former section chief at the United Nations, founder of an NGO, Give Them a Hand Foundation, and now president of the United African Congress, the organization which is sponsoring this event, along with the International Association of Applied Psychology and the Black Star News and Give Them a Hand Foundation. And let me welcome viewers and listeners from around the world as we discuss the topic, the coronavirus in Africa, the impact of the lockdown on food security. As you all know, and it's hard to keep up with the daily statistics, but as of today, the global statistics regarding COVID-19 are 6.4 million infected and 384,000 deaths. In the United States, it's 1.8 million infections and 107,000 deaths. One out of every 176 persons in the USA has been infected. Many European countries are or have been beleaguered with hundreds of thousands infected and many thousands of deaths. And Iran and Turkey now have over 160,000 infections each. Now, suddenly, Latin America has become the epicenter with the numbers in Brazil, Chile, and Peru skyrocketing. In Africa, which is the focus of our attention today, there is a story to tell, but frankly, we don't know if it is a positive story or a negative story. We keep hearing of impending doom, and in fact, we ourselves have said so, but so far, Africa is confounding the pundits. Africa, a continent of 1.3 billion persons and 54 independent nations, has a combined total of 158,000 cases and 4,505 deaths. That's much less than the numbers that we have here in New York State, where I live. The countries in Africa with the most infections and deaths, unfortunately, the Rainbow Nation of South Africa has the highest total, followed by Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, Ghana, and Cameroon. At the other end of the scale, Lesotho has two reported infections. Overall, where Africa is concerned, is this good news or bad news? I mean, the number of infections and deaths. What does the immediate future hold? And what does the long-term future hold? How are the people coping with the lockdown and how is that impacted on food security? Well, we have four speakers on our program today who will tell us about that. We are most fortunate to have with us the Minister of Food and Agriculture for Ghana, His Excellency Dr. Awusu Afriye Akoto. Next, we will have Ms. Anurada Mittal, Founder and Executive Director of the California-based Oakland Institute. Next, Mr. Timothy Wise, Senior Advisor at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. And last but not least, we have Kenyan, Mr. Njati Kabui, a farmer himself, and interestingly, a chef. He has a different perspective, a bit different from other speakers. Now, let me explain how the program will run. Each speaker will have the stage for 10 minutes for their presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer session with our resident panel of experts. And lastly, we will take questions from the participants that you submit in the chat box. So we're looking forward to um, a very exciting um, afternoon from New York. In other places, um, it's perhaps the morning or evening, but in New York we are here. And now I will call on our first speaker, His Excellency, His Excellency Dr. Awuso Afriye Akoto, Minister for Food and Agriculture for Ghana. Our team had a one hour chat with the minister yesterday, and I tell you, he is proud to be Ghanaian. 
proud of the direction this country is moving and proud of the job that his ministry is doing. Excellency, the stage is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me to be a panel speaker this afternoon. Uh, to give me the opportunity to inform your audience about what is happening in Ghana and Africa in general, about the COVID, its impact, and the response of policy, in particular in agriculture. To start with, the first case, we had the first two cases of COVID in Ghana on the 12th of March, uh, 2020. And the government decided to institute certain immediate measures, including closure of all borders, land, sea, and air, and suspended public and social gatherings, restrictions of movements of persons in the two major cities in a lockdown uh, for three weeks. We closed all schools, universities, churches, hotels, restaurants, and the hospitality industry was co completely shut down. Uh, we suspended the uh, markets, uh, restricted a certain, you know, in Ghana, we have open markets. Most of our food stuffs are traded in the open market. So we, we put restrictions on the number of people who could go into the market, including the sellers. And then we enforced all the protocols, personal hygiene, uh, encouraging people to wear masks and so on and so forth. As we speak to you today, Ghana has tested positive eight, just over 8,000 cases, of which nearly 3,000 have recovered completely, and we have 36 deaths, 36 unfortunate deaths. By far, most of them are not directly linked to COVID, but are related to um, all kinds of illnesses, heart illness, um, um, all, all sorts, you know, asthma and so on and so forth. So there are only about three or four people who have actually died straight from the impact of COVID. So this is the background uh, at the moment in terms of the statistics and so on. In terms of testing, we, Ghana was one of the first countries to adopt the uh, praise, test and treat the TTT right from the beginning, on the 12th of March, we started doing that as we trace in all people who have had contact with uh, those who are tested positive. And so far, we've tested over two, nearly 220,000 people. If you take it per million, Ghana is one of the highest uh, TTT uh, countries where we try to go looking for people who have had contact with those who are positive and their secondary tertiary contacts, bring them on, take a sample, and once we discover that they are positive, then we isolate them from the, uh, from, from the community for two weeks whilst undergoing observations and treatment. So uh, this is where we are on that. Now, uh, when we come to uh, the issue about the impact on, on, on food security, it's been very um, uh, mild. I mean, the first few weeks of the lockdown, no uh, uh, human movements were allowed between these two cities or coming in or out of these two uh, cities. That impacted heavily on the low-income uh, individuals who were more or less uh, uh, conducting their daily uh, income uh, by eating out and living selling their labor and so on. So such groups were heavily affected because they were not allowed onto the streets uh, to go around uh, their businesses. Therefore, government and NGOs uh, came together to provide food at spe specified locations for such people who could not afford uh, the food. That was a very uh, successful exercise, I must say. And um, uh, it's one of the factors which uh, meant that with now, the, at the moment, Ghana's rate of infection is going down considerably, and the government is now easing up. From the 15th of, uh, of this month in June, some schools will open, some churches and mosques will, will reopen, but in a very 
studied manner, not every church will be open. The, the maximum 100 worshippers will be allowed at any one moment, still keeping their social distancing, wearing their masks, and so on. So it's going to take quite some time for us to, to, to come back. Now, because of the uh, lockdown, food price, you know, farmer, uh, and as soon as it, the announcement came that we're going to lock down, people in the urban, uh, these two urban centers in particular, rushed to stock up on food. So food stuff prices just shut off over the weekend. And um, I had to go on national television and radio to assure uh, the, the population of Ghana that we have more than enough food and nobody needs to rush to buy uh, food. And of course, uh, the following week when the, the, the lockdown uh, was in place, food prices began coming, began to come, uh, come down. So the panic buying stopped. And um, the only thing was that because of the checks that had the, the roadblocks uh, for security to check movement of people and so on, that affected the movement of food. So the food chain was disrupted temporarily during those three weeks to the extent that food items, food stuff used to arrive in, in markets, in these open markets by four or five o'clock in the morning, ended up arriving at 10, uh, 11 a.m when uh, the, the market was over. So that really affected the supply chain of uh, our, our food stuff system. But since uh, the lockdown was lifted, everything has been back to normal. And uh, just to put you in context, this government, which is three and a half years old in office, had come uh, on the 7th of January, 2017, with a master plan to transform the agriculture of this country and through which we're we believe we could transform the economy. So certain unprecedented policies were put in place, targeting smallholder, smallholders in this country who still produce nearly 90% of agricultural output, giving them improved seed and fertilizer at 50% subsidy so that we can reach the poorest of the poor farmers to be able to, in terms of affordability. And of course, in terms of supply of fertilizer, Ghana is an importer of fertilizer, we, the government raised the quantity of fertilizers up to from 160,000 uh, on average before it took office. Uh, as we speak to you, we are distributing over 400,000 metric tons of fertilizer. So fertilizer is available uh, in crude seeds, of uh, hybrid seed of maize, rice, and other grains are also uh, been distributed potentially uh, this year. Uh, the, uh, we are aiming to be able to distribute about 29,000 metric tons of seed, including seed of uh, mainly the, um, the grains, when in actual fact, uh, before we came into office, not more than 2,000 metric tons of improved seed had been uh, the, the norm in, in the distribution. So you can see that we really increased the scientific content of our agriculture among smallholders in particular. And the results have been fantastic. I mean, we Ghana has become a breadbasket for West Africa in the last two, three years. We are exporting a lot of uh, food. In fact, the food surplus is such that it's become a headache for me as the Minister for Food and Agriculture, how to manage the surplus. So it's as if looking back that the government knew that down the line there's going to be a catastrophe of this pandemic and that we should take radically different measures in order to ensure that our food security is absolutely uh, fundamental. And that is yielding the right results for us. The impact of the COVID on food security in Ghana is, uh, I would say, I'm happy to say, is minimal. Uh, we are now in the planting season, we done, the rains are here, and this is uh, normally the season when food prices are at their highest. But, uh, and then there are no stocks, very little stocks of food. But I can show you, I've been around the country the last two, three weeks, visiting the forest regions of this country. And what I saw really amazed me that uh, we have stocks of food in the areas, we go to the markets and so on. So we, we are pursuing this policy, but we are not relying on our, uh, just uh, 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 on our, uh, resting on our oils. Because of this pandemic and knowing the demand that is going to create created around the region, we are stepping up uh, production of food. The beneficiaries of uh, smallholder beneficiaries have increased to 1.2 million, uh, million uh, smallholder farmers. Because of the COVID, 
that was a plan for 2020 because you raise it to one and a half million farmers. And it's just 300,000 farmers are going to benefit from this uh, huge subsidy on seed and fertilizer. And through that, we hope that we, we know that the production uh, surpluses will go even higher. And uh, we are preparing for that in trying to invest in mills, you know, down the value chain. We are talking about importing uh, uh, food processing facilities, uh, rice mills, maize mills, soya mills, uh, packaging materials, and so on, so that this country can be able to store the surpluses uh, that we are anticipating in the coming year. So basically, that is the response uh, we are getting in that situation with the COVID uh, anxiety. I, I hope uh, my 10 minutes are, I, I, still, I still have a few minutes because I wanted to share with you uh, further information on the government's pro program. The policies, the new policies introduced by this government come under the, the title Planting for Food and Jobs. And Planting for Food and Jobs is, it encompasses all the agricultural policies introduced by this government. And they've been organized into five modules. We have the food crop module, which uh, I talked about uh, a bit uh, in this presentation. Then we have the tea crop module, which focuses on increasing production export of, uh, of, uh, of uh, tea crops like rubber, coffee, uh, outside our traditional cocoa. Um, oil palm oil, oil palm uh, and, and others. Well, it seems that the reception from Accra um, is um, has failed for the moment. Yeah. I can point out that uh, the minister is at, um, at parliament and he stole um, some time to get out of the meeting to join this um, webinar. So we are very grateful um, to him for taking the time to do so. Uh, we hope he will stay on because uh, we certainly um, have questions that we would want to, to ask him and to learn more about um, issues like um, drought um, in the drier areas up north. Um, how, how, how do they um, address um, issues like that? But we will have to move on. Um, for those of us who remember the emergence of the African countries out of colonialism, and the role played by Kwame Nkrumah and Ghana. We're happy to see that um, Ghana is rising to the top again, not only in West Africa, and perhaps not only in food production. Um, but as he described it, Ghana has become the breadbasket of West Africa. And I must not ask, I must ask, why not feed the world? Anyway, the next speaker I will call on is Ms. Anurada Mittal. She's the founder and executive director of the Open Institute. She's an internationally known expert on development, human rights, and agriculture issues. She's a recipient of several prestigious awards and was named by Nation Magazine as most valuable thinker. She's somewhat of an investigator and has uncovered quite a few land investment deals in the developing world that lack transparency, fairness, and accountability. We thank her for that. She's an author of many books and reports. I could go on, but instead, I would say, let us hear from her. Ms. Mittal, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um... Greetings everyone from Oakland. Uh, very honored to be with you all um, on a very important topic. Uh, when it comes to the continent, food security is always um, 
a big topic for everyone and uh, also for the development schemes that are put forward. So amidst COVID, it's even a bigger issue. Um, just to move on quickly, I think, uh, in terms of what I wanted to uh, provide from the Institute, the concerns that we have, uh, I think in terms of our partners, what we're hearing is the disruption of local markets. Um, as the lockdowns happened, um, access to local markets in the informal market sector, the open markets that the uh, minister was talking about, um, the, the, the devastation to the livelihoods of the farmers themselves has been a huge issue um, in terms of getting the food to the communities, in terms of having uh, preparation for those lockdowns that the communities, farmer communities that were providing to the local markets, they have been, uh, they've seen a loss for their markets. And um, it's been um, it, the, 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 the challenge that has been created by not having access to the market, the loss of livelihoods, that's something that we have to remember and keep in mind as to how uh, those economies, uh, given that it's the small producers who are feeding uh, neighborhoods, communities, villages, that's gonna be essential. But I wanted to focus more on the pressures that will come onto the continent from, uh, from the financial institutions. Um, in the midst of the COVID, uh, we have heard of the, for instance, about the World Bank's group pledge to make $160 billion available in grants and financial support. Uh, sounds excellent, sounds very good what a bank like the World Bank should be doing. However, it's very important to remember that the calls of the civil society for the cancellation of debt went unheard. So these are not grants to African countries and around the world to actually provide support for economic development or to deal with the challenges presented by COVID. These are again loans that are being taken out by countries to respond to the crisis, which will result in greater debt burdens and as we know, conditionalities. Uh, the conditionalities, as we know, this crisis with the narrative being on economic restructuring, economic development, uh, the market has been impacted. Every focus is actually on, again, private sector investment. Uh, if you look at the branch of MEGA, Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, it has created a $6.5 billion fast track facility. Again, the goal being to drive private sector investment in the wake of COVID. Um, in terms of conditionalities, I think the president of the World Bank, David Malpas, was very honest when he said that the countries will need to implement structural reforms to help shorten the time to recovery and create confidence that the recovery can be strong. Uh, he talked about the countries that have excessive regulations, subsidies, licensing regimes, trade protections as obstacles. We will work with them to foster markets. Uh, basically, uh, I think it is very important for Africans to really look at, say, the example of Ukraine. Amidst COVID, IMF loan has been used to privatize land, to create a land market. Uh, and we already know that Africa has been the center for these land grabs. So this push for privatizing land to make land available is going to be one of the biggest threats, which is going to be promoted with the narrative of uh, uh, you know, making yourself attractive to for foreign investment, allowing corporations to come in and take over unused land and to put it to good use. So I think the model of Ukraine or what has gone on in Ukraine and COVID pre prevented protest and despite public opinion against being the privatization of land or creating land markets, allowing uh, sale of land, uh, that thing was pushed through as a conditionality of the IMF. The other thing that, I, uh, that is very important will be that we will hear about that as we have all moved on to technology and Zoom, that the wonders of technology will also allow us to uh, ensure land rights. So there is going to be a push to digitize land titles among COVID. The problem with that is this privatization and this land titling that is happening, um, it forgets the commons, it forgets the public lands, it forgets uh, you know, the customary land rights that countries like Zambia and other places have. So one needs to be very watchful of the push that will come to digitize land titles uh, amidst COVID. The other big thing is in terms of loan and the narrative of promoting food security, of enhancing food security is the push on uh, subsidies for seeds and fertilizers and other inputs. Now, the countries are gonna be taking loans will be taking and creating public debt 
so they can then use those funds to help Western chemical corporations. These inputs, which are based on chemical fossil fuel based chemical industry that is surviving is looking for the market, the biggest market being Africa. So you're going to have inputs that are being pushed. We see a lot of push uh, on East Africa, for instance, around uh, genetically modified seeds to change regulations. This, unfortunately, the pandemic has become another excuse to be pushing policy prescriptions, which work against the interest of Africa's food security, which work against the interest of the African farmers. The truth is that nearly 80% of the food that is consumed in this world is grown by family farmers. Instead of pushing for policy prescriptions that are going to put farmers in the driver's seat at the center of food security, we are again going to see the push for Western corporations and loans being taken up by African countries. So companies such as Bayer and Monsanto and others can get richer and the shareholders can get richer. So I think this is the biggest threat that is facing the continent in terms of food security, that COVID is going to become and has become another guise for pushing in um, technologies such as genetically modified seeds, which are basically Roundup Ready crops. So the African farmer will be dependent on buying GMO seeds from Western corporations and then buying Roundup from Western corporations. So um, despite the failure of these crops from India to Burkina Faso to uh, the example of cotton in South Africa. Uh, so the necessity for the African government to stand firm behind their farmers, to ensure land rights, to ensure the rights which are guaranteed through customary land rights, it is going to be very important as there will be you know, efforts to put them in shackles through loans and conditionalities. Um, we are seeing this happen in Kenya where the loan is for providing subsidies to farmers for inputs, but Kenya, unfortunately, is not alone. We see the same pressures on countries like Ethiopia um, and uh, push for, uh, in case of Kenya, there's a very clear goal that the Kenya Investment Authority has to approve 55 investment projects by 2021. And yes, we will hear that there are no conditionalities with these loans, as was expressed by uh, the minister in South Africa. I thought the opposition in South Africa said it most brilliantly when they said that the truth is that the IMF and the World Bank are not in the business of charity. And they're instruments that are used to continue to recolonize Africa in a new scramble for a natural wealth. So I think in the midst of COVID, there is a scramble for the natural resources of Africa. And we would be wise to ensure that that there's a strong struggle against it, that this pandemic which shall pass will not leave us with a pandemic of Western corporations pillaging Africa, which uh, cannot be stopped. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Smital. You have made an eye-opening um, statement presentation. Um, I believe many of us if not all of us share your view about the use of land in around the world, the, the use of land in Africa and the transparency that we require to see what deals are being made with uh, major corporations like Monsanto, etc. cetera. Um, and I also agree on uh, something you raised, which um, we should be looking towards debt forgiveness um, at this point and not piling on additional debt, um, supposedly to dig countries out of the hole while they're actually putting them deeper um, in a hole. Um, one of the webinars we, we are hoping to have in the not too um, distant future is on a new world economic order. And this was something that was quite um, popular, uh, at least that mantra, Back in the 70s, I think, when Prime Minister Manley of Jamaica um, was one of the people in what we used to call the non-aligned nations. I believe that is what we need now, a new um, world economic order. But thank you very much for uh, your presentation. We look forward to the questions that will be posed to you. Thank you. And uh, with that, now I will move on to the next speaker, Mr. Timothy Wise. He wears quite a few hats. He's a senior advisor at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, and he's also senior advisor with Small Planet 
Institute. Institute. At the former, he world, his work focuses on the future of food. His recently published book is Eating Tomorrow, Agribusinesses, Family Farmers, and the Battle for the Future of Food. Tim is also a senior fellow at Tufts University, Global Development and Environmental Institute, where he founded and directed its globalization and sustainable development program. But let's hear from Tim. Mr. Wise, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate being able to participate in this panel on, on such an important topic. Um, the, uh, uh, I've been asked to, to, to contribute um, my thoughts on the um, sort of the long-term implications of, uh, of the COVID pandemic for uh, food security in Africa. Um, some of what Anurata um, refers to as uh, the battleground now over, over Africa's future food systems. Um, um, my book took me to um, a number of different countries around the world and, and significantly um, three countries in Southern Africa, um, Zambia, uh, Malawi, and Mozambique. And so I was able to look at uh, the different ways that uh, the agricultural development and food systems are working for smallholders and the many, many, many ways that they are not working for smallholders. Um, I think the in the United States, the COVID crisis has, among the things it has revealed, um, are the many ways that our, our globalized food systems are vulnerable. Um, some would call them broken. Uh, the meat industry in particular has been a particular focus most recently because uh, very concentrated uh, value chains dominated by a few small corporate, a few very, very large corporations um, control meat production in large slaughterhouses where immigrant workforces are very poorly protected. There have been massive outbreaks in a lot of those uh, slaughterhouses. The companies have been uh, not at all transparent about um, uh, the extent of those infections and they have uh, failed to shut down their their plants. Backed by our president, uh, when President Trump uh, demanded that those that those uh, plants were uh, essential to national security and so had to stay open despite the high levels of infections and the risks to workers. What that highlights in a larger framework of looking at, at our food systems is that these long value chains dominated by very large corporations concentrating production in a very small number of places make us all very vulnerable to, um, to disruption. Um, and that kind of concentration is 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 a uh, has been revealed to be a huge problem in in the United States right now. It's a problem in Africa as well, in the sense that the rising dependence on food imports. Um, Africa used to be a, a net food exporter, and is now a massive net food importer. Um, means that uh, a lot of countries are not growing enough of their own food, um, and. Are, are vulnerable to disruptions caused by, for example, export restrictions um, that countries place wanting to ensure that their own citizens um, uh, have enough food to eat. Um, the, the, what I looked at in my book, um, I, I really set out to, to solve the puzzle to me of why government leaders um, at the international level, but and also at the national level, um, are, are so enamored with high cost, high input agricultural systems that are really not working for smallholder farmers. Um, and that instead, um, they should be, why they're ignoring um, low cost solutions offered by their own farmers using more traditional systems, but also innovations in those traditional systems that often go by the name of agroecology. Um, the problems in the, I mean, the COVID crisis was not on the, on the table when I was researching my book, but climate change was. 
And a lot of the vulnerabilities revealed by COVID are, were also revealed and are much, many of the same vulner, vulnerabilities revealed by climate change as it hit Africa. Um, the, the move um, which uh, the Honorable Minister from, uh, from Ghana was speaking of toward subsidizing the small farmers to purchase um, fossil fuel based fertilizers and uh, commercial seeds that they have to buy every year um, have, ma have made communities of farmers far more vulnerable to climate change and to the kinds of disruptions we see with COVID. The reason is that monocultures of supported crops like maize, which is one of the main crops that, uh, that these programs support with, with uh, subsidies, um, do, nothing, do nothing to increase the fertility of the soil. Instead, monocultures undermine the fertility of the soil over the long term, um, particularly if they're replacing more diverse types of farming where the crops were rotated or crops were intercropped, interplanted, um, uh, in a way that would restore soil fertility. Soil fertility goes down um, and the farmers don't get actually enough uh, of, a, of a productivity increase to afford the fertilizers without subsidies. So it's a short-term fix with long-term consequences because those farmers then become dependent on those inputs, they can't afford them, and they're then vulnerable to disruptions like we've seen now. Um, it's also a, a vulnerability for governments. Um, some governments, like the government of Malawi, are spending as much as 60% of their entire agricultural budget on these subsidies. Um, there's very little evidence that Malawi's small-scale farmers are more food secure or, um, or less economically vulnerable because of these subsidies. And yet it hamstrings the government in its ability to provide other needed services in agriculture, like extension and support um, and credit. Um, it also hamstrings governments at a time like this in um, devoting money to public health measures. Um, and as Honorado was speaking of the um, going into debt to do that, to respond to the crisis is a short-term fix with long-term consequences. Um, the, the problems that I think are revealed in the COVID crisis right now, and as we look forward, it's, we should all be asking what kind of agriculture, what kind of, of, of rural development do we want to see for um, African agriculture coming out of this crisis and looking forward at a, at a, at a future dominated by changes in the climate that are, make life much more difficult for small scale farmers um, is, is that we want a system that, we need a system that has shorter supply chains and a greater diversity of supplies, of suppliers, of food, of inputs and the like being part of these long supply chains, which the entire globalization process is designed to create, creates enormous vulnerabilities for, for developing countries and for small scale farmers in those countries. Um, import dependence is a, is a tremendous problem. Um, you, need the, you need the foreign reserves, um, the uh, foreign exchange to buy them. Um, that evaporates in a crisis. And that's one of the problems we've seen at an economic level with COVID is countries losing their export markets, losing their source of foreign exchange, thereby losing their ability to import. Um, they also are seeing monocultures of, of crops. And the reason that's a problem I, I like to remind people that uh, one of the main lessons of my book was that in diversity, there is strength. And that is really what we need to focus on when we think about food systems. When a farmer, a small scale farmer goes all in for growing uh, commercial hybrid maize um, using chemical fertilizers to, to get some productivity out of that maize, they have reduced their, their family's diet to maize unless they can earn enough money to buy other crops and other foods in the market. Um, in, 
it very often is the case that monoculture fields lead to monoculture diets, and they're very un they're very unhealthy for small scale farmers. They're also vulnerable because if you only have one crop in the ground, any weather event can damage that one crop and wipe it out. If you have multiple crops in the ground, it will uh, a drought will not wipe out all your crops. A, uh, a flood will not wash away all your crops. So diversity is really the source of resilience for small scale farmers and the push toward input subsidies for, um, for monoculture um, technologies is, it takes us in the wrong direction. Um, I saw a, uh, uh, I'll, every, I mean, I, I say, I said in my introduction, I wondered why leaders were ignoring the, the low cost solutions offered by their own small scale farmers all around them. I saw them everywhere. Um, I saw them in Malawi, I saw them in Mozambique, I saw them in Mexico, I saw them in India. I see them in the United States. Um, and I mean, one project, for example, I think illustrates this point in central Malawi, the Malawi Farmer to Farmer Agroecology Project is not relying on, on um, commercial seeds to increase productivity and nutritional well-being in their, in the community. They, um, they found a very nutrient rich uh, variety of orange maize, very high in vitamin A and very productive and desirable in local, in local, um, uh, local diets. Um, they propagated that and, and disseminated it in um, intercropped agroecology programs so that farmers wouldn't be dependent on outside inputs and they would have a diversity of crops. They did it initially as a nutrition program, promoting crop diversity to promote, promote nutritional diversity. It worked. And, um, and that diversity allows farmers in a time uh, of drought or flood or disruption um, to see a whole variety of different crops in the fields when a drought strikes and wipes out their maize, they still have sweet potato and cassava. When a flood wash, uh, sweeps through, they've got their land well tended and planted. The soils are enriched, they hold moisture, <clears throat> and, they keep, uh, and they keep topsoil from washing away. They're far better off in this kind of, a, in changing climates and in, uh, and in disruptive situations like we see with, um, uh, with the COVID crisis, and they are not dependent on having cash to buy inputs. Their actual out-of-pocket expenses, expenses are much lower, and that makes them far less vulnerable to disruptions that, in the case of the COVID crisis, prevent them from going to markets and selling, prevent them from going to, to off-farm jobs and earning money that allow them to send their kids to school. Um, um, hello, well, everyone. Yeah, I'll finish up with one, one last point, which is just that the, the um, Sustainable Development Goal 2 is all about ending hunger um, as we know it. And um, I think everyone is alarmed that we're not making progress on that measure. Um, COVID is certainly gonna set us back on that path. The, the, the route to solving that problem is gonna be an enhancing resilience and that's through diversity. So I'll stop there. Okay, uh, thank you, Tim. I would say we all would want to know more from you. Um, very interesting presentation. It um, comes from also a different perspective um, than we hear um, most of the time, uh, but it's very supportive of small farmers, which is the basis of, of, of farming um, in most of the developing world. Um, I would have wanted to hear a little bit about women, rural women in agriculture. As we know, um, you go into any of the markets in, in, in Africa, the Caribbean, it's women who are sitting in the, in the markets with their baskets of tomatoes and potatoes and pepper and stuff like that. Um, and they're doing the same thing that they have done for the last, their parents and grandparents have done for the last hundred years. Um, no access to funds to help them improve, no training for them to do things better, etc. But it is something that um, we should get to at, at, at some other point. 
We now move on to Mr. Njati, Njati Kabui. He's an internationally celebrated organic chef. He's a food strategist. He'll explain what that is. He's an urban farmer and food activist. He has a strong background in sustainability, culture, and food. He has worked with many major universities, spoken at these universities, appears regularly on the media speaking on culture and food. He was born in Kenya to a coffee farming mother and a restaurant owner father. Interestingly enough, both played a part in the Kenyan independence movement. But let me not take up his time introducing him as we are running out of time. Let us hear from Njati himself. Mr. Kabul. Thank you very much uh, for stage everybody. Uh, for, yeah, thank you so very much, uh, uh, Mr. Gordon, uh, and for all those who participated in putting this great uh, event together. Um, I want to, I also want to thank those panelists that went before me and for all their wise words. Uh, mine is going to be slightly different. Uh, I'm going to take more of a personal journey, uh, my own family's involvement and uh, talking from a personal experience as a farmer myself, as a, a children, as a son of farmers and uh, as an indigenous person. So sometimes we can hear all the big figures, which we do need to hear, but sometimes we can miss out on the experiences of that day-to-day uh, -day farmer. So I'm going to take a look at how food is used as an instrument or as an obstruction to justice for everyday person, especially people who are considered uh, uh, people with less power, people of less influence. And in particular about Africa, Africa has been a, co a continent that has been deeply exploited uh, by other powers for their own uh, empowerment, uh, starting with uh, Congo, where rubber was very instrumental uh, in creating wealth for Portugal, uh, and uh, King Leopold uh, and other corporations that came behind. So that's first point. Second point I want to say is that I look at food in a very personal way. I think the food is one of the most underestimated instrument of oppression. Uh, I say that having lived in a very small village when I was born and learning firsthand from my family about how food was instrumental in the colonization of Kenya. So I'll talk very, very briefly uh, in the few minutes that I have and hopefully try to walk, uh, try to walk uh, the listeners to, through the journey that Kenya taken, has, had taken prior to COVID-19 because COVID-19 is only accelerating a problem that has been here for a long time. Food issues did not start uh, in 2020. We've been having food problems in my country going back to 1900. In 1902, uh, the British uh, had something called Crown Land Ordinance that was passed by the British, which ultimately made all the land that is currently Kenya, uh, uh, put it, placed it in the hands of the queen. So any African who lived anywhere in those lands was living there uh, at the mercy of the queen. The queen could move him uh, or her at any time. Uh, so since 1902, the issue of food has been very, very central to our being, to our very beingness, as uh, we learned in the book, uh, The Pedagogy of the Press. To be human is to be free. And when people are not free, then uh, they are not human. So, and one of the basic needs for people to be free is land. People, you have to exist somewhere, you know? So uh, I want to talk very briefly about uh, how the land was uh, uh, dispossessed from the people and what that has meant to the culture of the food today. So let's look at the history of the, my people very, very briefly. In, in uh, 1888, uh, the British come. In 18, uh, and they come into contact with the Kikuyu. In, uh, in uh, 1890, the chief, which was a symbol of sovereignty, for the Kikuyu people, my people are called the Kikuyu, was killed by the British because they argued over the, uh, the fencing of a property that Lugard had been given by the chief, by the Kikuyu chief, for his own residency. Land is something that people was given. So anyways, because of that uh, fight, uh, the 
there was bad blood between the Kikuyus and the British. So ultimately, we know the land became uh, colonized and uh, through the uh, 1902 uh, uh, land ordinance. And now we entered a phase that we have not left yet. We came under the sphere of influence of the British, of the foreigners. So really, we've never really regained sovereignty of ourselves. My dad was deeply involved in the struggle for liberation because before the British came, my people are very, very sufficient in food. We had something that was called the, gran the granary of God. If you, if you walked along the walking village, uh, the walking highways between one village to the next, you'll actually find granaries where people would fo put food so that travelers would not have to carry their own food. So this community was highly food sovereign. And people, these people recognized that food is not something that you simply sold. That's, it's not, it wasn't a commodity. They had a very, very different perspective about what food is. So it, the people of every community would wake up early in the morning and take some food to the, what they call the granary of uh, Gai or granary of God, if you want. So, and the passersby would just simply walk into that granary, eat all the food they need, and then uh, proceed. So that just kind of, I'm saying that to give you a sense of how sovereign the people were. Okay, here in comes the British, and along with their religion. It's very, very difficult to separate uh, colonization from the religion of the colonizer. They go hand in hand. They're the handmaid of the colonizer. So the religion came and changed the culture of the people. It made them, it shifted the, cent the center of their being from themselves to somebody else, to the Pope or to the Church of England or somewhere else. So people started becoming disillusioned. Uh, in a place where I come from, the chief was called uh, Rakure, uh, Rakure, Rakure, Chief Rakure, in a place called Putudo. That is where the consolata uh, um, branch of the Catholic Church actually built their first foreign mission in 1901. They cut down the shrine, they destroyed the shrine and they built their own uh, uh, institution there. So all these things go hand in hand. So in 19, the, the, uh, the family, uh, the people resisted. And the, the one thing that are probably in the interest of time just to mention is that the movement that armed resistance that the people of Kenya formed was called Land and Freedom Movement. There's a reason why they put the land in there because the colonizers came, they took the land. There's no way you're going to be free before you have the land back. All right, and uh, I'm so uh, thankful because of some of the work that uh, Oakland Institute is uh, doing around these land rights, and that's why I wanted to uh, add that. Point. So finally, in 1963, Kenya becomes independent, but it becomes independent under a very, very new dispensation of trying to be like the West. The kind of food that these people are growing now are tea, uh, wheat, uh, coffee, food that is geared towards the Western market. So it's not food that was, uh, they are growing for their own use. Hopefully if we have a few minutes, we'll take a few pictures you can see. Uh, that uh, a lot of the land that we have in Kenya is growing commodities that we have to sell outside. So we are selling commodities outside, even vegetables we are selling outside when we are not food sovereign ourselves. So, uh, now, that's the first point. Uh, the, uh, uh, the thing that ex exacerbates the problem is that when you're building a country, a new country, to supply what other nations need, and then you do it, you're doing it on debt. Because this is a very, very central point to the discussion of food. As long as Africans are going to start after having been oppressed, and exploited by the colonizers. And then they have to be loaned money. And then you have this, the beginning of what we now become, we are uh, dealing with today as debt forgiveness. Why are they forgiving us debt? In international, there's something called odious debt. If you loan me money without due diligence, that's your problem, that's number one. Number two, if you did not pay reparations for the uh, damages that were done to the people, both cultural, uh, uh, land alienation, a lot of land is still in the hands of the British uh, to this day, and all those issues, then we are only setting ourselves up to, to become very, very, very uh, dependent on other people. So when we have issues such as COVID-19, then we start having major crises. I have and to say that... You have one minute more. <laughs> yes, sir. So I have to say that uh, the issues of 
food uh, insecurity are not new to the Kikuyu. They would have drought from time to time. And people would eat grasshoppers. People had their own ways of eating leaves, certain leaves, and storing certain foods. All that knowledge is being uh, lost because there is a major force to sell a new culture. Again, as I need, because of the donors who have the money and they dictate what kind of education system, what kind of uh, uh, government policies the government is going to implement. And then, and therefore we become food uh, illiterate. And that's where we are. Thank you so very much, Njati. Um, food and culture, are intertwined, yes. that's for sure. Um, when I speak of my country, which is Jamaica, I think of the few foods, I think of the reggae music, I think of the way the people talk, I think of the way the women walk, I think of, it is all intertwined and we must protect um, our traditions and our food traditions. We could easily be overcome by the McDonald's and the Burger Kings and the fast foods and things like that, and walk away from what we have been doing um, and, and what we have enjoyed and what has become part of our culture. I hope that we do not um, forget that. Um, at this point, we are moving to the second segment of our program. And that will be a question and answer session between all four speakers so far and our panel of experts. Um, our resident panel, um, they are Dr. Mohammed Nur Hussein. He's the chairman of the United African Congress. He's a professor of medicine emeritus and former chief of geriatrics at State University of New York Downstate Medical Center. He's Ethiopian by birth and uh, um, has been voted the, the number one doctor in the SUNY system on more than one occasion. I'm proud to say that, and a friend of mine. Next is Dr. Judy Koryansky, a United Nations representative of the International Association of Applied Psychology. She's a professor in the Department of Clinical Psychology at Columbia University's Teachers College. She's a trustee of the United African Congress and a psychosocial first responder and trainer in many infectious diseases epidemics and natural disasters. Mr. Milton Alimadi, a Ugandan by birth, adjunct professor of African history at John Jay College, a Pan-Africanist, human rights activist, and the publisher of the Black Star News. And lastly, we have Ms. Stephanie Evans, director of education and associate professor at the Harlem Hospital in New York City. She's a director of the Give Them a Hand Foundation. And we will begin this segment with each panelist posing questions to the speakers. And they may have follow-up questions, and, but we're hoping and we're asking the responses to be as brief as possible and to the point. Sometimes we have answers to questions that are longer than speeches and uh, we would like to avoid that. The answers should get to the point so that we can have more questions um, asked. And now I will turn this over to the four um, resident um, experts who we have, who I have named. Please go right ahead. Mm -hmm. I see you uh, there, Dr. Nurusain. Well, thank you, Gordon. Uh, I think this is such an important program, a uh, question of food security. And I don't think we have done justice to the presenters uh, about what they have to say within the limited time that's available. I would really ask for us uh, to perhaps uh, call back these presenters in a post-COVID uh, 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 pandemic uh, environment and still address the issue of food security. Um, I, I, I have questions for each one of them. Um, let me just start by saying, you know, uh, uh, somebody mentioned the genetically modified food. I remember reading um, an article in New York Times several years ago when Zambia was uh, faced with famine. There was a uh, food aid that was sent from the United States, in, you know, 
and the Minister of Agriculture refused to accept it when he discovered it was uh, uh, GM uh, grain um, because he was afraid it might eventually end up, uh, you know, outgrowing the indigenous uh, grains, uh, then ending up becoming dependent on Monsanto for your grains in the future. So, uh, of course, somebody wrote an editorial, beggars cannot be choosers, unfortunately. Um, but be that as it may, uh, the, the, the issue of food is really central uh, to our human existence. And I think uh, you all took uh, different approaches to it. Uh, the diversity aspect, the personal story, uh, I, I, it's just, it just uh, so much wealth of information. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, His Excellency, the Minister of Agriculture of Ghana, Dr. Apoko, uh, for that really comprehensive uh, presentation of uh, what his government is doing, um, you know, to secure food, uh, food for its uh, uh, citizens. Um, I, I, this is, of course, part of it is the COVID uh, pandemic uh, forum. I just want to ask uh, the minister, I think I have touched on this before, uh, the infection rate in Ghana, of course, is high, it was something about 8,000. But what's impressive is that it ha the, the mortality has remained uh, well, well below 0.5%, uh, which is better than the um, world average. What is Ghana doing to limit uh, this uh, the, 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 the death rate in I mean there's something we can all learn you have touched on this before but I think it's more important for everybody to hear what is it exactly that Ghana is doing to limit the death you know rate uh, on this and uh, I'll come back to with my question to the rest of the presenters for excellence yes Am I supposed to answer now? Yes, please. Yes, okay. Um, first of all, uh, as I said, the, um, uh, we found out on the 12th of March was the first time that we uh, discovered that there's this, uh, two cases that had arisen in Ghana. And these were uh, travelers from Europe. So um, the first thing that we did was to go back two weeks before with all the records at the airport of all arrivals around the, the world and trace them directly. Uh, there were about 12, 15,000 of them. Uh, the airport authorities were able to trace all of them because they, they, on the form they left a telephone number or, or whatever. And then we were able to isolate, isolate, take tests, uh, sample, uh, their samples uh, from them for uh, testing for the coronavirus. After that, the next two, uh, the next two, three days, which came, all the flights, we quarantined everybody coming from uh, uh, around the world uh, into the airport of Ghana, and we had a thousand two hundred of them that. At the government's expense, we put them in quarantine in hotels and other hostels and so on for two weeks to test them at the beginning and at the end of it. At the end of it, we found that out of 1,005, 50 of them were found to be positive. So the rest were released after two weeks. Uh, we carried on with the tracing, you know, the tracing uh, uh, contact tracing and treating is a very critical, has been very critical to our uh, success there. So uh, uh, through that, we have been able to do over 200,000, uh, take samples from over 220,000 individuals who have been in direct contact with anybody who's proven to be positive in their tests or even the secondary or tertiary contacts and so on. So. We have a whole team in the communities around the country uh, calling, uh, on telephone, uh, arriving at addresses and so on to interview and to take samples and so on. So that has been a very effective way for us 
uh, in, in our attempt to control the disease, because then it means that we are not just doing any blanket uh, controls, but we are targeting potential uh, uh, um, uh, victims of the virus. And uh, as I said, 36, unfortunately, uh, have died from co corona-related illnesses, uh, of which only about four or five are directly linked to the, 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 the uh, COVID-19. All the rest of them have been with diabetes, hypertension, uh, um, they had underlying medical problems. And um, the recovery rate is even more uh, uh, attractive because we're talking about 8,000, just about 8,000 positive cases uh, discovered in Ghana, of which, as I speak to you, nearly 3,000 have recovered fully. And when we say recovered, it means that having taken the sample uh, and proven to be positive and having isolated these people, after a while with the treatment, uh, they are tested again twice and found to be negative before they are released back into their, uh, their community. So it's been a very stringent regime of, of uh, testing, tracing, and treatment, uh, which we have uh, undertaken. If you take, um, uh, that in terms of testing, uh, per one million, uh, Ghana has a population of about 30 million, and we, we've actually taken samples from two, two, 218,000 uh, people around the country, you'll find that in terms of every test, uh, every sample taking a million, Ghana has one of the highest rates in the world, not even in Africa. So, uh, and it's continuing. Uh, we are very uh, uh, rigorous in this uh, pursuit. And not only that, we find that in, in the last two, three weeks, the rate of, of, of uh, infection is going down considerably. And so we are beginning to ease up uh, on the movement of people in terms of gatherings and uh, some schools are opening on the 15th of June. Uh, churches will be allowed uh, from this uh, Sunday on to, to reopen but under very stringent conditions um, where distancing, social distancing are, are critical to be observed. Churches are to submit their floor plans as to how the seating arrangements are going to be uh, they, that everybody goes into the church or the mosque with a, with a, a face mask uh, and all those uh, measures that we are taking to ensure that uh, we're able to control the disease in, in Ghana. Thank you. Um, my next question is to, uh, uh, to uh, Mr. Amital. Uh, being from Ethiopia, of course, I'm familiar with the work you do uh, or you have done uh, uh, regarding the uh, indigenous people in the Omo River Delta when uh, Ethiopia was building the um, um, Gibe Three Dam, uh, where some of these people were displaced. Um, of course, many of the African countries face the problem of uh, dealing with poverty and the need to develop, uh, and of course, hydropower being one of those, uh, at least uh, Ethiopia's path to development. Um, uh, very often we applaud these things in the beginning, but we realize that, uh, uh, you know, it's displacing people. And I'm glad you mentioned the sexuality of the uh, uh, human rights and, and uh, development and, and uh, uh, food security. Uh, so, my question, I think, is also this applies to uh, Tim and um, uh, Kabui too. Uh, how are you going to reconcile the need for these countries um, in Africa and other developing countries to, uh, you know, uh, eliminate poverty and they feel that there is a rapid way to develop is to, um, you know, uh, uh, do some of the things that uh, develop their energy power, energy power, and also, uh, you know, uh, increase the yield of whatever they do. And of course, we know now that 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 uh, it's a false assumption, but that's what the general feeling is. How do you reconcile? How do you compete an organic, natural growth of uh, food with the uh, 
you know, uh, different grains uh, that are being developed by Monsanto's and others to that would that that include increase the crop, the yield of the crop, and then the, uh, in the short term, at least, it's felt that they could provide the abundance of food. I'm, I'm throwing it out. There is uh, the sort of a provocation, so I might say. Maybe you can answer. Um, sure. Any one of you can answer, yeah. all three of you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yes. I, I would say I think there's an urgent need to even look at the whole narrative, uh, the narrative of development. Uh, if you talk about Ethiopia, you know, building of a large scale, the largest dam that there is to be in Africa, um, that's called development. But that is a disguise to hide the displacement, uh, the building of the dam in Lower Omo, for instance, where 500,000 indigenous uh, agro-pastoralists have lost their livelihoods because they would grow as the river Omo would flood. So I think the question has to be asked that how do policymakers reconcile uh, devastation, destruction of livelihoods? How do you call that development? Uh, so I think we have to really question what the definition of development is. And we know in case of Ethiopia, the construction of a hydroelectric, uh, you know, large dam is for sugarcane plantations because the ambition is to become the Brazil of Africa. Sugarcane plantations do not feed people. This is for export. This is for the cotton plantations. Cotton does not feed people. And these plantations are not owned by the Ethiopians. These are the large so-called investors. Again, the language investors, the thieves who have come into Ethiopia to take over the rich land so they can grow their crops like cotton and they can grow sugarcane and exploit the soil, displace the indigenous, displace the Ethiopians, make them poorer, make the farmers, turn them into plantation workers at best, and then export that outside. And that's called a development model. You know, it used to be called colonization, but today it is called the development scheme for Ethiopia for other African countries. In terms of genetically modified foods, uh, I'll just quickly address you said about Zambia. Western countries have been trying so hard to get the foot of genetically modified uh, crops in Africa when there was a food shortage. Food shortage meaning there wasn't enough maize. If you look at the traditional crops, Zambia had enough to eat, but they tried to use, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, sorry, I'm in, in the United States, but the language of beggars. I mean, Africa is a continent which they also say can feed the world, but to use the language of beggars cannot be choosers. To say that the countries like Zambia or Zimbabwe should be taken to the International Criminal Court, something which the United States does not believe in, US was putting pressure on it to accept genetically modified foods. Now there is the garb of COVID, Ethiopia coming under pressure from US that sign up for GM crops. There is no evidence that genetically modified seeds actually increase productivity. In fact, evidence from the United States, um, uh, you know, when you look at scientific evidence that has been put forward, it actually shows that the, uh, you know, the production of maize and others has gone down. You look at the experimentation or, no, not the experiment, the, what has happened in India, Could you wrap up in 30 seconds, please? Sure, and it just shows that this has been nothing else other than pushing Western corporations like Monsanto and the producers of GM crops. This is not about humanity or feeding humanity. All right, thank you very much. I, I know uh, that my friend, Dr. Nurusin, probably has half a dozen follow-up questions, um, but he won't have the opportunity to ask them now. Another time. Yeah, and I, I, would give, I would give, I would give Mohammed. Same. <laughs> Mohammed. Yes. I, Going to um, Judy and Milton, I let them have an opportunity to, okay. to ask questions. So, um, thank you. I, I've heard so many abuses from all of the presenters in such a really passionate way about what's being done to the farmers with corporate pillage and death and um, the land rights. Uh, from an intellectual point of view, that is so upsetting. And from an emotional point of view, as a psychologist, I have to point out what are the farmers dealing with in terms of their anger and depression and the, what we know about as suicide among these farmers? 
any one of the, uh, uh, you have talked about it as an institute of persecution. Milal, you've talked about all these abuses. I, I, yeah. I can take, I, I can take that if, if, if it's okay. Okay. Yes, yes. Go, ahead, ahead. Sure. go ahead. Take it. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, if I can only say one thing, uh, let me also recognize that these are very special times. There are people who are on the streets and they will be rude of me and maybe the panel in general not to recognize that there are people who are protesting for justice. So I just want to uh, give a shout out for all those and a recognition that there are people who are standing in the front lines to stand up against injustices. Wow. Oh, now, having said that, let me uh, go back to the question uh, that you asked. That uh, as a son of a farmer and a farmer myself, it's almost a travesty for me to have gone to a, an institution of higher learning and not understand or pretend not to understand that we have structural issues. We have structural issues. We have systemic racism. That's what we are dealing with. There, there is no development. You have to ask yourself, how is it that African countries are called developing countries? For what, for 50 years? You're gonna be a child for 50 years? When are you gonna be developed? These people today, the, the, um, the statistics uh, about unemployment came up that 17 million, 17, 1.7, uh, 1.87 million people, extra people file for unemployment. This is a country that has failed to run its own country affairs. How do you have experts, expert, the expert nation, most powerful country, having 1.87 million people filing for unemployment within 30 days period, bringing the total people who are unemployment unemployed to 25 million. So back to the question, what development? What, what, this, there's no development, there's no issue here. Instead of talking about a lot of other problems, let me just uh, point, maybe answer your question by uh, pointing one or just one simple fact, which is science. You know, I, um, I appreciate that we have people who are well educated here, so they'll understand. I was fascinated to learn that the part of the brain called the insular cortex only deals with two major issues: satiety, how when you feel when you're, uh, uh, it deals with issues of hunger. It tells you when you're hungry. It tells you when you're full. That's part the insular cortex. The very same insular cortex deals with issues of immorality. If somebody says that, oh, so there's a genocide going on in uh, Rwanda, a million people were killed in 100 days, which is the equivalent of a 9-11, 100 times over. We hear about 9-11. We don't hear about the, the Rwanda genocide. And very few people really paid a, such a high price for it. There was no war that went on. So I'm only saying that this is a major crisis. There's no intellectualization about it. Scientifically, socially, culturally, these people who are decimated. The country, these so-called uh, African countries, all they do is provide market for used clothes, for, uh, and they supply, so, so, supply minerals that are needed. They supply a uh, market for waste products that we, we don't need in the West. That's all, it's the same colonialism. Why should we lie about it and sit here and pretend all oh, people are trying, what are they trying to do? If they can give black people rights here, if people, pe black people can eat here, people are saying underlying causes of the person who was killed, the black person who was killed. That's an issue in itself. What, what are, why do we have underlying causes? Why do we have people who provided the capital for this country to build, to become what it is, still having underlying issues with things that are so preventable, like heart conditions and the high blood okay. pressure and diabetes? That's it. My friend, all right, thank you so very much. Thank you for your response. And um, now I have to go to Milton. Milton Nalima there, our next panelist. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you all the presenters. And I like how at the end of it all, it really, uh, boil down to one issue which we're dealing with, the, the continuing struggle for total independence in Africa. And that's what we're really discussing here today. And I think Kabui put it well when he said, food is an underrated instrument of oppression and in fact, uh, neocolonialism. And I agree with the assessment presentation by Tim Wai, I agree with with a uh, presentation by Arena and with uh, from uh, the minister as well, Minister Akoki. So my question is very broad, and this one, anyone of you can answer it because it's very broad. What 
are the possible best paths or strate strategies toward African liberation. Because if you don't, as Thomas Sankara said, <laughs> if you don't control your food production, how can you even talk about independence? And uh, he said, if you want good evidence, look at your plate. If your food is imported, do not tell me that you're independent. So I want any one of you to address this issue in the broad context. And I have a specific question also for the minister, actually, Mr. Koko. When I go to Whole Foods and I pick up a, a uh, container, I see at the back it says, uh, Coke, Coke chocolate made in Belgium. And we know Belgium does not produce cocoa. So tell us what strategies Ghana has toward eventually having more value added products in Ghana's production so that Ghana can accrue the benefits of these projects. And is the new Africa free trade area going to play a, a significant positive role in expanding opportunities for African countries in terms of production and export? Thank you. Those are my questions. Yes. Um, have you asked the question, sir? Milton? Who yes. you posed the yes. question? No, I said any one of them. I said, any, then I had a specific one, Minister Koko, but the rest is broad. Any one of them can take a bite at it. And that's why I wanted I, to keep I, it I, I don't so think that I wouldn't have to ask multiple questions. For any question as yet, so maybe he wishes to take a shot at it. Uh, yes. you're, you're, um, uh, can I can I come on? Yes, Tim. Yes. Oh, yes. Go right ahead. Please. Go ahead, Mister Minister. Yes. Okay. Let me tackle the issue about cocoa and chocolate. You know, uh, recently, the the past one year, there's been this talk about uh, the fact that between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, we supply almost two thirds of the world's cocoa beans. And uh, the cocoa in the, the world chocolate industry is worth $120 billion. And yet we get only between the two of us less than $7 billion. And that, that's how unfair the whole arrangement is. And, you know, we have this, uh, uh, the government has adopted this, uh, what we call Ghana Beyond Eight, that we have to change this colonial relationship by ensuring that in due course, or we are not uh, going to export uh, raw material like uh, cocoa beans and the others, but we add value here in Ghana. And when I was making my presentation, you may have heard me talking about the fact that we want to process our grains and so on. That extends to all uh, crops, uh, whether they are uh, cash crops or they are, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are food crops, that we add value before they leave the producing areas to the urban centers, or we add value by pro uh, agro-processing before they leave the shores of this country. Uh, this uh, policy has been pursued since the 1950s, uh, 1960s, sorry, after, after independence, but hasn't had that impact because we still uh, export nearly 60, 70% of our, our cocoa output as beans. Uh, we have vigorously, since we came into office three and a half years ago, we are vi vigorously pursuing uh, this idea that we'll be able to export uh, our beans uh, in the form of chocolate or other prime and, and other primary products. And myself, I've been very busy going around the non-traditional uh, 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 consuming regions like in Asia, uh, in Africa, and other places promoting the name chocolate and other products. So. We, we have started and we are also inviting investors, both local and foreign, to come and set up uh, cocoa processing factories. We have four processing factories, uh, companies in Ghana, one of which is, uh, is uh, publicly owned. Uh, it was originally government owned, but we floated it on the stock exchange. And that's a leading producer, the cocoa processing uh, uh, company, which is based in Tema, which is getting more and more uh, uh, markets for their products uh, around the world. So we have made a, a good start on that. Now, let me come to the second, is, uh, the first one about a strategy for African independence. Of course, we, uh, Ghana, like other African countries, have been spending precious foreign exchange on importing food items like rice and chicken. 
and this government is determined that this whole thing about uh, spending billions of dollars in importing when Ghanaian farmers can produce it more efficiently and cheaply that is being done. And this is being done under the Planting for Food and Jobs program that I talked to you about. I've spoken to you about the fact that we are building surpluses. We are in a very comfortable situation of managing surpluses rather than managing shortages, which has become the story of Africa. And this is the time for us to be uh, self-sufficient. In the case of rice, which is the biggest uh, export uh, 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 foreign exchange expenditure, we are, uh, we are determined that in the next two years, Ghana should be self-sufficient in rice. Uh, through the planting for food uh, program. We are giving out more seeds uh, to farmers. Uh, we are giving more fertilizers to supply to farmers. The fact of the matter is that Ghana, until we came, had one of the lowest uh, applications of fertilizers in the world, 10 kilograms per, per hectare, when the world average is 130 kilograms per hectare. And that's why we recognize this. Ghana has one of the lowest productivity of food production in the world. We are changing that by bringing in uh, the, these support systems, and not only a monoculture, a monocrop uh, uh, culture as uh, indicated by Mr. Weiss, because for instance, maize is by far the most important food security crop in Ghana. North, South, East, West, every ethnic group rely, is the staple in this country. And therefore it was, it was necessary, it's necessary that we increase the production in order to re reduce hunger. That in the three years that we've been in the office, we've been able to increase uh, maize production from an average of 1.7 million metric tons to nearly 3 million metric tons in a matter of just two and a half years. And that is uh, something that we are very proud of. And of course, now we are not importing uh, maize anymore. We are rather exporting maize out of this country. And so are we targeting that in the next two years, we become self-sufficient in rice, and we'll start exporting rice to our neighbors and beyond the shores of Africa. So that is the self, the, the independence that uh, you talked about, and uh, that's the way we are going about these uh, matters here in Ghana. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Um, we have um, a very special friend, uh, guest in the Gordon, audience. Gordon, Gordon the yep. others haven't responded to my question yet. I want them to get an opportunity. <laughs> To respond to the question too. Oh, okay. Uh, Do you want me to respond to that? Needs to be brief. In the Thank you. Go ahead. Shall I respond to that question? Yes, go right ahead. I mean, very briefly. I know we're we're tight on time. Um, I think the really important um, question about true independence, um, which the minister is referring to, is that. Uh, political independence comes in one form, and economic independence comes in, in, in a different way. In a globalizing world, um, the, the rising demand that I heard all over the world as I researched my book from farming communities and others was for what they call food sovereignty. Um, not food self-sufficiency, but food sovereignty, the right to determine and control how, they, how countries feed themselves, how communities feed themselves. And that concept of sovereignty is, I think, really important. Um, the idea of seed sovereignty relates to the ability of farmers to choose what sorts of foods they're going to grow and what kinds of seeds they're going to use to do it, whether they're going to rely on <coughs> seeds they need to purchase in the market or whether they're going to rely on seeds that they can save from year to year and don't have to pay for. Um, those types of um, measures, which I referred to in my earlier talk as the kinds of low cost solutions um, uh, available and, and evident all around the world, if, if we choose to look, are the ones that I think um, create that kind of sovereignty where, to get back to Judy's question about suicides, farmer suicides come from indebtedness um, and desperation over indebtedness. That comes from being having too many cash outlays and suddenly your crop fails and what are you gonna do? Um, and so um, the sovereignty comes from um, from reducing that kind of dependence and increasing local control. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Arunada? I think um, Milton is expecting some comments from you. Um, 
Milton, I, 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 if there's a specific thing, I think. Um, yes, how, how, I mean, with the option so narrow, how do they liberate themselves from the World Bank IMF regime? Especially when the people are looking at Brazil as a possible source for funding independent of IMF, and now Brazil is under a right wing fascist administration. <laughs> So what, what are their options for alternative paths? Well, when it comes to these Bretton Woods institutions, World Bank, IMF, um, you know, uh, it's been addressed. The language that we have to, first of all, it's not about debt forgiveness. This is for debt cancellation. Most of the time, the countries have been burdened with loans that have not benefited the countries, that have not benefited the people, that have not led to economic development. They have been pro projects that go from large dams to uh, coal power plants. So for a bank, when it was making bad loans, those banks would go out of business. So it is quite interesting that institutions which were created at the end of the Second World War to restructure uh, war-torn economies, they're still doing that, rebuilding uh, European and uh, United States of America. So it is very important that this system that has been created to keep countries in bondage through giving loans for development, that has to be challenged. Um, in, you know, when the institutions turned 50 years old in the 90s, there was a very clear demand that 50 years is enough of these institutions. These institutions need to be done away with. We need to have a different development model and that will need to come from the people in the countries that they make their policy uh, makers, that their government officials, their ministers accountable, that we have, for instance, agricultural policies that benefit the farmers. Here we have agricultural departments, as Tim pointed out, which are not providing extension services, which are not providing credit to smallholder farmers. They have turned into institutions of, of privatizing land, of bringing in uh, you know, technologies which we know are not working. The focus is on Africa because that is the next market for these Western corporations. Green revolution, which plundered my country, India, is now full on on Africa through the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. So we cannot wait and hope for change to come from outside. The change comes from within. I think uh, we cannot go back to the way things were before COVID. We have to create a new agricultural model. We know the solutions. We know agroecology can feed the world. We know that the smallholder farmers already produce enough to feed the world. We know this is the way to, uh, you know, this climate, which is, uh, and the world, which is warming up. We know how to cool that down. The problem is that we have to deal with those in power who prevent that from happening. And I would say that what needs to happen, Milton. Thank you very much, Arunda. Um, I was saying, uh, Milton, I hope you're satisfied, whether you agree or not, but I hope you're satisfied that you had responses from the three um, of the speakers. Um, we do have um, a, very, a couple of very special guests. They are all very special. But a friend of, of ours, a friend of the United African Congress, um, Ambassador Sierra Leone to the United States, Ambassador Sidiq Wai. Um, I'm going to, and he sent me a question that he would like to ask, and we're going to put him on to ask a question. I'd also like to acknowledge um, one of our guests um, today, uh, Mr. Gilbert Roshan, who is a former president of the prestigious Tuskegee University. And uh, uh, Gilbert, welcome. Okay, um, perhaps we can get Ambassador Y on to make some comments, to, to ask his question. I don't know who we will pose it to, but um, we should get him on. I also note that we had a question or two as to whether or not we are talking about COVID-19 or something else. But we, I would have to admit that we have migrated away from COVID-19 today to post-COVID-19 development. So I do think it is relevant um, what our discussion is um, today. But um, do we have Ambassador Y? Um, yes, I, I don't know if you can hear me. We hear you all right. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
first of all, let me thank you so much for uh, the assembling these distinguished panelists together. Uh, we've gotten a lot of education, and thank you the moderators. I think you have a phone and an iPad or a phone, and but you okay. have two open, and you need to shut one for there's a, a feedback. Yes. Turn okay. The phone off. Turn the phone off, not the... Uh, the phone. Okay. Turn off the other device. Okay. Okay, I'm back good. Now. Thank yeah. you. So, uh, I, I learned a lot and listened a lot. And I want to thank all of the, the panelists for participating and really thank you um, the organizers for pulling this together um i was just following the discussions some numbers came to me according to the africa development bank study agribusiness we reached one trillion dollars by 2030 Currently, Africa imports between 35 to $40 billion worth of food annually. With an able, young, ready workforce of 1 million African youths ready to enter the workforce every month, and then we have almost 70% of the arable land for agriculture. My question is, is Africa actually missing the boat in feeding themselves where creating tons of millionaires in the world? That's my question. Perhaps one in particular you want. Uh, perhaps the minister, as you are all brothers in in um, ECOWAS. Yes. Brother, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I think you've raised a very important question, and it is something that, as a, as leaders on the continent, to find uh, the solution, and I can. And only tell you what we are doing in Ghana to correct the imbalance, mm -hmm. that we should spend as much on food imports as we export our major export, Anna cocoa, something like $2 billion, is something which is not sustainable. We all agree to that. In fact, in some cases, it's even worse in some countries. And this is why, for instance, in this country, uh, with this government coming into office, we've taken very radically different approaches in order to be self-sufficient in targeted food crops like rice, which has now become a basic. When I was a kid, rice was eaten only in selected households in the urban areas and nowhere else, and very privileged uh, uh, homes. Now rice has become as basic as maize, which is uh, our source of livelihood, basic uh, uh, food security in Ghana. And yet we have all the endowments of land, both in the northern part of the country, which is uh, savanna uh, uh, land and very rich for, with a lot of waters, rivers and riverings uh, uh, going up north and south and east and west of the country, uh, of, the, of the region. And also in the forest belt, where we have these huge valleys uh, running across uh, huge areas that could easily grow rice without irrigation to get two crops in a year. And all this endowment has been lying there for thousands of years without any exploitation. Now we have entered the forest valleys and uh, you will be glad to hear that the responses that we are getting to government initiative in these valleys are incredible because these valleys alone can supply the whole of West Africa our demand for rice. And yet we're spending precious billions of dollars 
in importing rice and giving jobs to farmers in Vietnam, in Thailand, in America, in Brazil, another in India. These are the sources where we, we are we're importing uh, rice in this country. We have a very ambitious program. In the next two years, by 2023, 2024, Ghana will become self-sufficient in rice. So we can save the billions of dollars that we've been given out, uh, handing out to farmers in these countries and give it to our farmers to enrich this country, to use the money to, to, to do our roads, construct roads, uh, build our hospitals and our schools for our children and so on. So we are very clear on that. And in addition to that, spending uh, something like $350 million every year importing chicken. And these are chickens which have been slaughtered maybe three, four, five, ten years ago and uh, dressed with all kinds of uh, chemicals being poured on us and so on. And the essence of the reason why chicken, uh, the poultry industry collapsed in Ghana was because we are not producing in, uh, adequate soybean. And since we came, we have uh, been able to increase soybean production from 50, 60,000 metric tons. Last year, we did 200,000 metric tons. And soya enriches the soil, uh, uh, is a, a nitrogen fixing uh, a plant, and farmers are finding it with the, with the support that we are giving them on these subsidies and so on, finding it very profitable to grow vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the other crops. So we, these are all initiatives that we are taking in this country, which uh, hopefully should serve as a cue to uh, uh, others, including Sierra Leone, uh, to uh, 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 you know, pick up their, their bootstraps. So we're, it, oh, it's not lost. I mean, I think that the realization is, is, is clear that Africa is the next food basket for the world. In the next 20, 30 years, I'm sure the situation would have changed and rather, uh, rather than important, we'll be back where we were the last century at the beginning of the last century, most of the last century, of the, 19th, uh, the 20th century, where we were feeding the world. I just re read a, a piece yesterday where after the war, uh, someone has, uh, was given an account that their uh, parents in the United Kingdom were here as uh, colonial administrators and were taking, they were, they were actually sending uh, food parcels of rice and others to them in England. And this is only yeah, 60 right. years ago. So, we have okay. to restore that. That is a kind of Thank thing you, that we... <laughs> I know you. You're, you're really very passionate about your uh, Ghana. What is happening in Ghana? We thank you uh, for all that you have said, your participation in this um, webinar. And I want to thank Ambassador Y for um, joining us um, and uh, even the question he asked. But we are running out of time now, and. Um, we are going to have to forego the questions from the audience. Um, I guess Ambassador Wai was the only person who had the opportunity from the audience to pose a question. Um, I want to thank all of the, the, the speakers, um, uh, Minister Akoko, um, Tim Wise, um, Arunda, um, Njati. Um, you contributed immensely to this. Beautiful program. I also want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank all the panelists and uh, those who are um, the technical support who are in the background. And uh, having said that, I Gordon, 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 one word, please. Gordon, yes, yes, Dr. Nur Singh. Yeah, uh, before you close, I think I, I still uh, no, no, no. I'm calling is going to uh, for the. I'm sorry? Uh, okay, say, I'm say calling you have for one minute, you have one minute and then Stephanie. You have one oh, minute. Oh, okay, okay. Now, I just want to, uh, again, um, you know, uh, put out my call for the participants to come back uh, to us, uh, their uh, schedules permitting, in, to meet us in a post-COVID-19 world. Uh, on the issue of food security. And I, I, I echo uh, Gordon's uh, sentiment that there is a need for a new world order. And I think we are touching on some of the issues that need to be addressed in that world. Uh, in fact, we are beginning that new world order by the worldwide protest movement that you see now calling for justice uh, for George Floyd. But that's really carries a much wider uh, call for, for justice in general.
economic justice, political, everything. So I'm hoping that we can pursue this topic again uh, down the road, a few months down the road, if that's okay with you. I think that is, um, we should definitely do that for, we, are, we have left this in a pregnant position. It's exciting, it's interesting, but it has not yet delivered um, any final um, position. We should do, definitely be doing this uh, in the next couple of months. So thank you very much, um, Mohammed. And now mm -hmm. I'm going to have uh, Stephanie do the, the wrap up and uh, point the way forward. Stephanie. Stephanie. Yes, thank you, Gordon. I would say that uh, before COVID-19, uh, food security was a serious concern throughout Africa. According to the Food and Agriculture Aid Agency, 239 million people in Africa were chronically undernourished, 40% of those being children under the age of five who were stunted or malnourished. These food crises in Africa were driven by economic shock, climate change, such as weather extremes, droughts or floods, conflict and insecurity in many regions, health shocks such as Ebola, malaria, pests such as the unprecedented locust swarm that has devastated crops in Eastern Africa, making the continent more dependent on food externally sourced, and of course, the continued displacement of people. In addition, with the COVID-19 pandemic has radically increased this food insecurity in Africa. We have heard movement, we have heard limitation of movements and loss of livelihoods, limiting the availability of agricultural labor and products. Transportation to markets reduced due to movement restrictions. Markets themselves constrained by lockdown and physical distances lowering the purchasing power uh, of people, which contributes to rising food prices. COVID-19 also poses uh, other additional challenges. The lockdowns, border closures, and curfews, which intend to slow the epidemic, are, as quite rightly said by Tim, um, are disrupting the supply chain, leaving farmers with oversupply of seeds at times, fertilizers. Remember, farming also accounts for a large source of employment. And remember also, people need income to buy food. In terms of government, there are stalled industries such as oil and tourism, also affecting the purchasing power of most uh, countries and also impacting food prices. These decisive lockdowns imposed to prevent the virus spread, as, as, as all the panelists have described, disrupt the continent's supply chain, leading to rising unemployment rate. And of course, we can predict that rates of chronic mal malnutrition over the next 12 months could double. In addition, there's a heavy reliance as described by the minister, Tim, um, and others on heavy reliance on importation due to increasing urban demand and compounded by weak infrastructure and farming methods. Restrictions on imports and exports have been disrupted as we described limiting the distribution of food nationally and internationally. However, concomitantly with that, at the same time, the cost of food is increasing while export and so on and cash crop prices are decreasing. With this confluence of events, the lockdown, the local markets, which are the local background of the informal economy and supplies of the majority of food, mainly uh, controlled by women in the community, we have the risk of shortages that have to be mitigated. And who are affected by these, uh, the impact of this? The poorest and most vulnerable. People living in conflict-affected regions are risk at risk due to the inability to deliver humanitarian food aid. And don't forget migrants and refugee populations who already are living in food insecure situation who are significantly affected. And children, especially those younger than five, who are most vulnerable because of their critical nutrient needs. Remember, as everybody has said, Africa is 25% of the global landscape suitable for crop cultivation, sufficient to drive the continent's economic development and adequately uh, enough to feed its population. 
Yet, as described by all the panelists, since 1980, Africa has been an importer of agricultural food, particularly as described by the Minister for Wheat and Rice. African uh, countries re rely on food security uh, and need revenue from imports. The imported 400 million tons of cereal, um, as reported by uh, the World Food Program in 2018, has created an impact locally, especially in this uh, pandemic. So there are new challenges that the pandemic uh, has foisted upon us, as described by the panelists. So moving forward, what do we need to do, as everyone has described? Improve the food security and resilience in Africa. Uh, all types of food and agricultural system, modern, traditional, open air markets, small stores. We need to stabilize income and access to food, as well as preserving ongoing livelihoods and food production assistance for the most acutely food insecure population. We need to ensure the continuity of the critical supply chain. And as described by the panelists, we need to make them shorter. All six sectors need to work to scale up climate smart agriculture as described by Tim Weiss and Ms. Mitral. We need to provide uh, resources such as grants to help small scale farmers. We need to solve agricultural development challenges in Africa to fundamentally improve food security. As described by team, we need a shorter supply chain, reduce the amount of imports, reduce the monocultural nature of crops and promote diversity. As he describes, there's the uh, diversity strength. We need to reduce uh, the monoculture of seeds and monocultural diets. We need to distribute sweet, uh, seeds for future harvest to ensure seed sovereignty as indicated. Regarding these challenges mentioned by the speaker, the, all these require urgent action. We need to respond to the non-health impact of the COVID epidemic. So we need to talk about availability, access, and stability of the food supply in Africa. Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, well, um, you've given us marching orders, and I think the world needs to follow your advice follow your lead. <laughs> well, thank everyone. I want to thank everyone who um, signed in um, to join up with this program. And um, please take note, we will be having part two and part three of this um, particular program on food security and related issues. So you will receive our um, invitation um, in, the in the coming days to participate in this. And please come back. Thank you. And again, thank the speakers, um, Minister uh, Akoko, um, Tim Wise, um, Smital, and Njati, and of course, our um, technical team, uh, Mora and uh, Mohamed Marda, who's here and did not get the opportunity to pose his questions. I want to thank you all. Have a good afternoon or morning or night where you are. Goodbye.